This is the Self Taught or Not podcast with Dylan Israel and Eric Hanchett, where we teach you the do's and don'ts of software development from two software development professionals, one self taught and one not. I'm happy to introduce our sponsor, Remote.Work. That's Remote.Work. They are a remote only job platform. And not only for developers, some of you may know that I've been working remotely for about nine months now. It's the best perk and benefit I've had of any job, and I don't know if I'll, I can ever actually go back. So not only do they have programming, but finance and legal, customer support, sales and marketing, business and management, DevOps system admin, design, product, copywriting, and of course, engineering. And you can search by various uh, time zones because sometimes you want to work in different time zones. You want to travel, you want to do it all. You know, I, I can understand that. Or even by full-time, part-time, internships, contract. It's really quite astounding how great of a job platform it is. Because I, I get asked questions all the time. How can I find a good remote job? Remote.work is your go-to place. Check them out. There'll be a link in the show notes below. All right. So we have a fun episode. I was talking to Eric. I said, you know, Eric, man, I just got out of a relationship and I'm salty. And I want to do a salty episode and I don't have enough content about relationships, but we do have enough things that we can talk about when it comes to sort of the tech, IT, web dev, software engineering role. And that's what we're going to talk about. Some of the, uh, maybe the more funny and less fun parts of, you know, our day to day. Yeah. I mean, I made a quick list of just some things that I, that irk me. Some of them are, are pretty silly. Some of them are a little bit more in depth, I guess, not, not as silly. But yeah, you know, I'm kind of. I think this will be a fun ep- episode. We can just talk about some things that irk us, some things that we wish were a little bit different in the tech industry. Maybe some are very specific to web development. Some are just more tech and and geek central, I guess. Yeah, and I, I guess I'll go first. Uh, one of the things that drives me nuts so much so that it's actually a question I ask now when I'm interviewing is what browsers I have to support. I am, you know, it's 2020. All right. I don't have time to support IE. I don't, you know, that's just going to make me depressed. It's going to make me angry. And so IE is, is just the, um, I forget who used this term, but it's kind of graphic. IE is the herpes of the, uh, of web (laughs) web development where it just, it just is something that won't go away and keeps sprouting up from time to time was the example given. And I couldn't agree more. It's, it's something that causes me utmost pain. And I, I, uh, I I won't support it anymore uh, at any role I go to. I think we all as web developers need to to plant that flag and say, no, we will not support IE, which the latest version was released 10 years ago. I mean, it feels like 10 years ago, but it's been a while. I think IE 11 was, was a while. It's so, IE has lost the faith of the developer community so much that Microsoft has basically abandoned it I think they're keeping it on life support until the end of life of Windows 10. I think it's it's literally going to be still around until 2025, but then they're going to end of life support on IE IE 11 at that time. And they since all the developers in the world hate it so much, they created a new browser called Edge, which I think is really now going to Chromium. So it's going to be a Chromium based brace based browser. Excuse me. Because like everybody hated IE so much. I remember back in the day, I used to have to support it and just all the polyfills and everything to get things working it has has been and is still a nightmare. But I also remember if it really far back in the day, they, they used IE, I guess I, I can tell a little bit of the history of IE. I wasn't a web developer during its peak, but I know that at some point IE just stopped progressing. And they were stuck at like IE six or seven for years and years. And for a while, web developers all the way into the early 2010s had to still support a really outdated version of IE six. And it was just a nightmare. And there's still like, you still hear these stories, these horror stories of companies that are in, in some government place and they, they haven't upgraded from windows XP or some really old version of windows. And they're all stuck in, in a really version of I really old version of IE, and I I just shake my head. It's sad. Yeah, it's um, I uh, I worked at my very first job. I had to support IE because they they did government consulting, and it broke my heart. It really it really did because it's like 
I mean, you can do polyfills for like JavaScript and stuff like that, but you can't really do that for like CSS. So all the modern responsive design stuff like Flexbox, CSS Grid that make your life so much easier, it never could do. We had to float things and clear things. It was awful. Yeah, and I I think even some bigger frameworks now are starting to drop IE support. And I think even like YouTube doesn't support IE. So I think I looked at, at the I think I looked at a few graphs and it's only like one or two percent right now is IE. So definitely it's time to drop it. I think at my at my work we don't we don't support IE at all. We don't even look at it any longer because it's like less than I'm, a I'm percent. I'm drawing a line in the sand. A line in the sand. I'm calling for all developers. We do not cross the IE uh, line anymore. It's done. It needs to die. Yep. Do you guys still support it at your work? Hell no. And I, I, ever since my first job, I literally ask at every single role before I go. I don't care if it's Google. I don't care if it's Microsoft. If they're telling me I got to support IE, I'm not taking the role. Glad for you taking a stand. Let, let's yeah. go. To the next no, I mean, in, unless they give me a pain and suf- suffering bonus, that's what I need. <laughs> I'll be like, oh, yeah, I got to support IE. All right, this is my salary. And uh, I'm going to need $50,000 bonus every year for pain and suffering to do it. <laughs> Let's go on to the next one. Um, I think we can both agree on this, is interviewing. I think there's hate on both sides of interviewing. Interviewing is a very difficult subject for software developers in general. And I think there's there's two sides of the camp. There's the one side of the camp that um, hate this algorithm type interviews. And so I guess this is more in the standpoint of you're trying to interview at places. And then there's the other standpoint where maybe you like it, algorithm interviews, but you hate take home tests. Like I think the two biggest complaints I always hear in the web development community, or at least any of the developer community is algorithms, take home uh, algorithms and take home tests. Like it's usually both sides of it hate him. And so let me explain the algorithm side. A lot of people think, that giving an algorithm interview, and we touched on this, if you watched, um, I think by this episode came out, we actually have an interview with someone and we talked and he's a computer science student. We talked a little bit about algorithms, but the general hate against algorithms is that when you do a, an interview for a job, a lot of times they're gonna ask you these algorithm questions that really have nothing to do with the job that you're doing. They're more of a way to test your communication and problem solving skills. And there's kind of uh, kind of a lot of hatred because there might be a developer that has worked in the industry for 10 years. But now since they're moving jobs, they're going to have to grind leet code is what they call it or or any of these other services out there to practice these algorithm questions to get these jobs instead of having these jobs kind of cater towards the experience that they have. Uh, real quickly on the other side, People hate take home, um, take home tests, and people hate take home tests because a lot of times um, a lot of companies have unreasonable size projects for people to do for take home tests. Sometimes people say um, it takes them more than a day. Sometimes maybe two or three days to finish these take home tests. Um, people sometimes think that it's free work for the companies because they'll either put a part of their code base in it that they might end up using. Um, Some people say you have the only reason, the only way they'll do a take home test is if they get paid for it because they think it's just free labor. So I guess um, for me, I think those are just interviewing in general is it's not perfect in the, in our industry. And I think there's a lot of room for improvement on both sides. Yeah. I like the take home test personally. Um, if it's a small, like two hour sort of thing, like, Hey, connect a, like the ones that I found that I thought were okay was connect to a get call, map the data and display it on the screen. Not like build out an entire feature set, uh, <laughs> something like that, which I've, I've gotten those. And it's like, dude, I'm not spending a weekend on this. Um, I'm so sick of interviewing that I won't even go through traditional interview processes right now. And like, granted, I'm not looking for a job, but I've had it. I've had three or four separate recruiters from Amazon this week reach out to me. I'm like, listen, I'm not going through your interview process. If your if your hiring manager wants to hire Dylan, if they want to hire me, not just a software engineer. You can set up a call and I'll talk to them directly, and we can start the interview process that way. Because at this point, I'm so unbelievably sick of interviewing for roles. I haven't interviewed in about a year that I just don't even want to deal with it. 
Has that worked out yet, though? <laughs> Have you been able to? No, no, <laughs> not, not in the slightest. Um, it's but but here's the thing: is like that's what I that's what I want, right? Like, um, I'm happy where I'm at. So if you're gonna try and steal me away, then you need to you know you need to sweeten the deal a little bit because I I don't want to go through a five step interview process. I don't want to do an all day interview. I don't want to study have to study for algorithms or do a take home project. What I want is someone who especially when guys like you and I and uh, have so much content out on the internet related to software engineering, it's like, you can clearly see we're doing this on a regular basis. And here are, I think I have 50 or 60 repos at this point of code. Like you can go and see, whatever it is you're trying to find out it's out there. Just go and I'll send you some links. Uh, but no, it hasn't worked out, but um, it doesn't work until it does. Okay. It will work one of these times. <laughs> Find the new partner. Uh, thing. Yep. Go ahead. Oh, uh, I was gonna say to add to that. that. I'll, I'll go ahead real quick. I was gonna say to your point. Yeah, that's uh, we we definitely live. Uh, both of us are out there so much. I, I think employers honestly are just lazy. Like they don't have enough time to like if a, if you apply for them to a job, they don't have enough time to like sift through the hundreds, if not thousands, of projects you have on GitHub and the lines of code and try to figure out if you're a good candidate or not they they put the onus on you to like prove yourself to them but i see it yeah, both sides. i'm happy i'm happy to send a curated list you're like hey what is this position about this is what it's about i could send you 20 things that support that i'm a good candidate i don't i'm not saying go and do a you know write a uh, auto you know write a biography about me i'll send you the resources but i'm just i'm not going through 20 hours of interviewing i'm not talking to your recruiter for an hour. I'm not talking to your devs for a couple hours. I'm not doing an eight hour interview, a take home project, multiple algorithms. I, I want to strip, I want to skip straight to the point where I talk to the person who makes the decision and we do a cultural and a brief technical interview. That's all. Um, otherwise I'm not interested right now. Now, if I'm unemployed, I'll be going through those interviews real quick, but that's a different, uh, different, uh, scenario. For sure. One thing I have a, a love hate relationship with is recruiters. Um, you love them when you need them and you hate them when you don't. And it's uh, recruiting is, I think uh, I heard Chris Hawks call them skin peddlers, <laughs> which is uh, somewhat true. Um, I've had good and bad relationships with recruiters. Uh, when I was unemployed, they were, for, when I got laid off at a role, it's the first people I reached out to and I got a job through them. Um, there's sort of good ones and there's bad ones, but the bad ones, man, they promise you the world and deliver nothing. Um, it's the equivalent of like, of a, of this is what I think of it in my mind is like, Oh girl, I'm gonna make love to you all night. And then like 10 minutes later pass. And then like, what are we going to do with the rest of the night? It's like recruiters will promise you the world sometimes and deliver nothing. Um, I, uh, I really, it's it's hard because they're salespeople and like, do you believe a car salesman? No. Why should you believe a uh, a uh, you know a job salesman? Because that's what they are. It's good to remember too with a lot of these recruiters that they get paid when you get paid. So, it somewhat of the the things are aligned. Maybe some of your everything's aligned, but it's not really because they're literally if they place a candidate, they might get. A percentage of their first year of salary. So some of these people are making like ten thousand, twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars for every person that they place. So it behooves them to like contact a hundred people. And even though they know that ninety percent of those people probably aren't qualified, but if they could whittle it down to like ten people and ghost a bunch of others and not really answer questions, then if they can get like 10 solid candidates that they can send off to this job, then it works out really well for, for them. I mean, I'm, I'm exactly the same way. There's some good recruiters, but a, a lot of not so great ones either. And I don't know if you guys can hear that. I have people outside working. I apologize. Yeah. I would say rule of thumb, if they work for an agency, you should probably have a little bit more of a uh, skeptical eye. If they're an in-house recruiter that works for the company, it's, a little bit more more trustworthy 
but I've had I've had so many bad experiences. One of the more popular LinkedIn posts I did was I posted a screenshot with you know the name blurred out, but with the basically a recruiter was like, I think you'd be great for this role. And it was literally the same role I had at the same company. I was like, dude, you didn't even look at like where I currently work. It's like you did no research. You're just out here spamming. Uh, it's uh, but hey, make that money, I guess. That is so lazy. I think I should be fired. That that also that's that's a good point you mentioned about where the recruiter is coming from to to put a pin on that point, so to speak. Yeah, if if you have look at the recruiter's email address, I always look inside uh, in my email inbox. I look at the return address. If the domain name matches the company that they're recruiting for, you're like ten levels higher than these random companies that spam people and re- do do recruitments. Now I know there's some. Being in uh, talking to some people in the Austin area, I guess there's a two or three really high end boutique uh, recruiter e- recruitment agencies that if you can get on their good radar, they place you at pretty high level jobs. But uh, I think for the random person, you're going to get a lot of random recruiter spam. By the way, a little tip to to reduce the amount of recruiter spam that you get: if you're in the web development industry, if you take React. And C sharp and as some of the other skills that and Ruby on Rails off your profile, that will reduce your recruiter spam by like 10x. I, I did that, and I stopped getting as many uh, recruit recruitment spam because I don't want to work in a React shop. I'm a big Vue.js fan and Angular fan, so um, once I did that, I, I stopped getting as many emails. And by the way, I think both me and Dylan can say right now we're both really happy with our jobs, so we're not looking for other jobs but it's just worth noting that that this exists Try, trying to make sure your boss doesn't listen to this and be like, <laughs> get eric out of here uh okay so i'm gonna do a little uh, funnier one this is more broad this is this is i'm a little salty sometimes about this so every movie stereotype movie tv show 90 percent of the time not all the time but most of the time you get the they 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 have two sort of I don't know stereotypes for developers. So you either get the Big Bang Theory developer, which is the socially inept introvert, doesn't know how to talk to other people, like completely geeky, hates the outsides, um, you know, really sheltered, never had a girlfriend, or you get the hacker that's this like beautiful actress that's that uh, breaks into computer systems in five seconds, like completely unrealistic. The GUIs, if you look at the graphical user interfaces of their terminals, they're like completely unrealistic. And it's just kind of, it's just kind of bad stereotypes because there is all sorts of people that get into this industry. You don't have to be the geeky white, either super skinny or super fat white guy that has no friends that's not married, that lives in their mom's basement to be a developer. And you don't have to be like the beautiful actress. Look, it looks like we have uh, another, another person joined the podcast right now. (laughs) Yeah, I know. I also have people. (laughs) Anyways, I just think it's, it's kind of fun stereotypes, but then they don't really, really, they're not really conducive of what the industry is really like. I'll also say that, that, um, there's a couple of shows that do this right. Mr. Robot is a really good show that actually handles this situation really well. They actually have real quote unquote hackers that help consult the show to make the scenes really real. The GUIs are actual like Unix systems or Linux systems that people have set up on their laptops. All the jargon is actually real while a lot of shows just, they just, you know, fake it. What do you think, Dylan? <laughs> I, I mean, I've never paid so much attention to these GUIs. Uh, but, I mean, yeah, man, they, they're they stereotyping the shit out of us. <laughs> That's the truth of the matter. Um, but, hey, uh, you know, it's uh, we all come in different shapes and sizes, all right, people? Um, although it's funny you made a uh, – I, uh, I just did a video on my YouTube channel about how I'm uh, perpetuating the developer stereotype because, like, I am the nerdy white guy at – one time I had like glasses and braces and all my hobbies include like dorky things like reading sci-fi novels and, and, and uh, watching anime and playing video games and sort of 
Uh, but yeah, uh, everyone's different. Everyone's unique. And um, it's uh, it does seem more or less that there is that. I mean, I haven't. Let me put it this way. I haven't seen one where the individual doesn't sort of fit a stereotype. Yeah, exactly. And and to truth be told, some of these stereotypes, uh, there is some there's some truth to some of it, but usually it's just so overblown. It's completely untrue. I mean, many of us, like I've in my job, all the developers are married. All of them have kids. You know, we have geeky hobbies. Like a lot of us like sci-fi. Some of us like anime. Uh, some of us um, like Star Wars, but I mean, generally nowadays, like Star Wars and and Star Trek. I mean, they're so mainstream. There's almost everybody likes them. So it's like it's it's eclipsed the geeky stereotypes that people. Anime is still pretty niche. Um, but what, what do you got for Dylan? Let's move on. All right. All right, because we we can talk about how we're stereotyped for years, I <laughs> imagine, and how all those dudes ordered their wives from Russia. Uh, but <laughs> no, um, that's a joke, probably. Um, so uh, the another thing that drives me nuts, and I I don't know that there's a good solution for this, and this isn't a critique on anybody I've worked with, but just bad requirements seem to be something that transcends, and I. It's it's weird too because I've worked at organizations that have had scrum masters and business analysts, and um, there always seems to be some sort of gap between what the client wants and getting that out of their brain onto the paper and requirements that just never seem connected and just always causes a headache. And I I and sometimes I think like the solution to this is actually have a developer be a BA, but then what developer would want to be a BA? I'm that's on my list too. Yeah, requirements is always a a problem in the in the industry. It kind of just more more general like um it kind of goes to the whole agile mindset and how how that works. I don't know if there's any easy way to fix that, but it's it, it's definitely a problem. Uh let let me go on. I will let's kind of go let this kind of dovetails with that. I think uh, with requirements problems, I think just deadlines in general are just really hard in software development because uh, it's you know we're in an industry that it's notoriously known to be for deadlines to go over. You know, projects end up ballooning up. There's it's really hard to to hit them. Estimates are hard in software development. People frequently are very bad at them, and many developers are very bad at estimates i used to be where i used to work for a boss that said take any estimate you think of and double it by two because we need to pattern estimates and because you guys are bad at estimating he basically told us so um, if you're in a organization that allows you to do this padding and 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 you're you've done the agile process a few times and there's a whole bunch of ways to do it we've talked about in the past of having points and then you can see how what your what's the word the how many points you get each spread? Your like, your velocity. Velocity. Thank you. Yep. What your velocity is, you can sort of get better at estimating. But it, it's a really hard solution, and and the, I guess the the salty part of it is that if you're in an organization that really really is hardcore on these deadlines, you might be in a situation where developers feel a lot of pressure to work overtime, or they might feel a lot of pressure to make the deadlines or they may cut um, kind of cut corners. I mean, I guess at some point you can de-scope things and that really helps, but it, it kind of, and you end up in this environment that's very, um, it's very pressure filled and it's not healthy. Now I'm not saying I'm, I've been in environments like that. I've heard of them. I think definitely at times in my career, we've had like these crazy deadlines that we couldn't make and there and we had to work extra hours luckily most of the time that's not the norm for me but i think it's still sort of a problem just because of the industry we're in yeah i would say this is probably um it's especially as a junior developer where you, you don't quite yet have the years of experience you don't have the confidence to to say no you feel like this is just the the norm and it, unfortunately a lot of 
a lot of workplaces just suck. I would say seven out of 10 places you're going to work are going to be in that negative environment. And it's part of the reason that developers have an average turnover of 18 months compared to, I want to say, if you look at career related fields, it's closer to four or five years. And there's a reason for that. And there's also reasons that statistically speaking, developers have higher anxiety and higher stress levels than the average employee. And uh, what I would say is that as you go and progress in your career, hopefully you'll learn that it, this is not your responsibility to deliver on deadlines. I, I don't care about deadlines. And uh, this has frustrated people in the organizations I've worked at, but like nobody's going to die. Like Jim's not going to die. Mary's not going to die if I don't get this in by Friday. And oftentimes the business will change their requirements or they'll, the requirements come incomplete that, okay, cool. Well, I, yeah, I pointed it at this and we thought it'd take this amount of time, but then things have changed. Requirements have changed. And uh, they'll just say, we're agile. Uh, so um, don't feel the need to to do that because what ends up happening is you put the extra time in this week, you'll put in the extra time next week. And then that extra time is expected and it really shouldn't be. Once that becomes the new norm, like this, this heroic effort that you have to put in every single sprint, every single cycle that you go through in your business and it becomes the new norm. That's when like, you really need to think like, is this the right place I need to be at? Cause what happens? You just burn people out. And then when you got burned, burned out people, like that's when people start looking for new jobs. Um, I, I I don't know. Yeah, that it's it's sad too because even though we're in an industry that everybody's looking for developers and everybody's looking for more advanced developers, it seems like some businesses still don't get it that you can't burn out your developers. Um, like I said, I'm I'm blessed at the job I am, I'm at, and Dylan's blessed at the job we're at. We don't experience this, but if you're in a place that's constantly like this is the norm, it's like. I used to be, I worked, my last company I worked at a couple of companies ago, we had something called emergencies that we had to fix. We had to drop everything to fix. And then sometimes we get multiple emergencies. And this was pretty common. Like once, once a month, there would be multiple emergencies happening at the same time that there was emergency bug fixes. And then we came up with this word, the emergenciest is. So we had to figure out what the emergenciest is was at that time. So we'd work on that first and then we go to the second emergency. So that is something and a situation that I would, I'd never want to be in again. That reminds me very much of an issue at a place that did burn me out quite a bit where there was always multiple number one priorities and like, well, they're both, they're both number one. Well, which one we need them both. Well, which one first? Well, we need them both. It's like, all right, dog, which one's one a and one B if you can't <laughs> say, like, oh man, uh, um, kind yeah, of to know, the same point. Uh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. I was gonna say that that often happens too when you're in bigger organizations and the right hand isn't talking to the left hand, so to speak. So you have one manager who thinks his projects the 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 most important. Then you have another manager like, well, this is really important, and then they can't agree on like what is more important. So they think they're both important. Like, no one's gonna step. Someone should step up and say, hey. Do this first, then this. So you get this weird thing where like both are really important. And if everything's important, then nothing's important, right? Exactly. And somehow it's, you shouldn't be saying that, but uh, I do. Uh, and by the way, uh, some sometimes people think like being the one that speaks up and says these things and makes these points about that. Um, be Be willing to do that in person. And, uh, you know, respectfully, of course, and make that point because that's how stuff gets done. Otherwise, you just sort of are working on two things at once and everything's late instead of one thing delivered on time. That's also being part of, like a little bit of a leader. You know, if you're able to like speak up and, and speak your mind and be respectful and and it's OK to disagree with other people and it's OK to get a little emotional every now and then. Obviously, I went scream and yell on every phone call. But I think if you can kind of weave that pattern and and be a leader, I think I think that's that's definitely a part of it. Emotional? <laughs> you 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 you're giving up impassioned speech as to, we need one priority. I believe I had a dream that there was one priority at this organization. Like, what do you, what do you mean? I I, every, I, I agree with everything minus the emotional part. <laughs> no, no, I. I've been in organizations where every now and then someone 
it gets a little emotional. Like they start screaming or they, they raise their voice or they, yeah, I, I think that's okay. You don't want it to happen every phone call. You don't want to be at the end point of that getting like yelled at. I've been in organizations where like leadership is basically yelling at everyone, but, and sometimes that happens. It's okay. I think that's, that's why I'm the point I'm trying to make. Oh, so I, I don't think that's okay at all. Like it does happen. Mistakes happen, but that's the mistake. Uh, we're all adults, and if you feel the need to yell or raise your voice at a team, it's one thing to be confident. It's one thing to speak sternly, but um, your employees are not children and should not be yelled at. Uh, but uh, I, I have been in those situations, and uh, in my point of view, it's a mistake, I guess. But, uh, Wait, so, yeah, I guess, I guess maybe I'm going to backtrack a little bit. I, I still think maybe sometimes it's okay. But I guess it depends on the yelling and the situation, everything like that. If, like, it definitely, if you're a manager and you're, and what, how you deal with your employees is to yell at them all the time, then that's not okay. But if you're, if something is really happening and you want to be passionate, you can maybe ever occasionally yell at people. Maybe we disagree a little bit on this. But yeah, have I, you, I, I, I think you're just wrong. I don't think there's a middle ground on this, but. We'll we'll have to agree to disagree on this one. All right. Have you ever been yelled at at before, at a, in a company? Yeah, I, I. Oh, I have, and I I politely pulled them into an office. I said, "Listen, uh, I'm a grown ass man. Uh, <laughs> if if there's something that you need addressed, you can talk to me with some respect, and we can address it. So, like, I I don't need you to yell." for me to understand that you're stressed because somebody above you is stressed and somebody above them is stressed about getting this feature out. You can simply say, listen, man, we're all going to be in some trouble. If we don't get this out, we got to get it out. We got to put in extra time. Yelling does nothing except showcase that you have poor communication skills. All right. Maybe, maybe I'm coming back to your side a little bit. (laughs) (laughs) Um, so to the, um, sort of, uh, chain off this based off of, uh, you know, we have these we have these bad requirements and these deadlines. And what that leads to is something that I just can't stand is poorly written and untested code. Just a spaghetti code that you look at it and you're like, what? Why? Why? You, why did you do it this way? And, you know, I would say like 50 percent of my job at every organization I've been at is just trying to maintain or fix poorly written code written by people who had no business writing code. And all, in all honesty, looking at what was going on in these code bases. Man, that is that is, that is definitely frustrating. It's, it's also, I think all code eventually becomes this way. So I'm going to, I don't know. Do you think that eventually, like all code kind of just happens? I mean, people, we just talked about turnover. So if, if everyone in your company on average is turning over every three or four years, and of course there's always going to be people there that have been there forever. And so everybody's coming into this new code base and it's impossible. You're never going to have the same level of skill for every person that comes into this code base. Some, some are going to be a little more junior. Some are going to be more senior. Some people are going to know how to write good code. Some people are going to just know enough to get by. Just eventually over time, code is going to be rewritten. It, you know, we're going to have thousand line functions after a while and classes are going to be, you know, 10,000 lines. And, and with a lot of companies, it's go, go, go. There's no time to go back and and fix things. I mean, there's this word in our industry called technical debt, and that's almost a bad word to management because it sounds like, well, we've accrued all this technical debt. Let's fix it. And management's like, there's no time to fix. We need to get X, Y, Z feature out. That's like pretty common. Yeah, and I so I think this goes back to being the developer responsibility. I mean, you're always going to have, we got to go, 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 go. And what ends up happening is that a lot of, developers they get stressed right it's normal reaction and they start they start cutting corners where they aren't you know when you write some code you write tests for it to make sure that does what needs to do and so that when someone goes in and they make a change or an update that they see that oh they didn't break anything you don't have to do a full regression test of the entire system great so they'll skip the test and um, that's why tdd is so important is the main reason to do tdd is uh, you do test first, so you have to do the testing. And, you know, then maybe you skip code reviews and skip the PR process and you skip all this sort of stuff 
in the effort of speed, but what ends, ends up happening is you do get those thousand line functions that now there's no way to, and I, I've raised this up at numerous organizations where you're going so fast that you're actually going slower because you don't have a strong foundation. Once you don't have a strong foundation, whether it's a foundation I built or not, you are, you're, you know, you need, sometimes you need to slow down to speed up and it's a hard concept to deliver, but, and it's a, it's a hard thing to say to businesses, but you have some responsibility as a software engineer, as the one in charge of that system to do exactly that. It goes to the point where, when do you know to it's time to slow down and when do you know it's time to speed up? So if there's a new feature that needs to be out that can bring revenue into the business, but you've noticed that if you're going to jump into this code base, let's say you go into two components that they're pretty badly written, they're they're really long, they definitely need to be broken down into smaller components and simplified, but that would add in an extra week to the project, maybe an extra three or four days. I mean, how... When is it time, how do you make that case to be like, hey, let's let's slow down a little bit. It might add maybe a week to our estimate, but we're going to have a much cleaner code base. And then also, it kind of goes to the point of a lot of developers want to rewrite everything. If you're in the business side, if, if you talk to the average developer and you give them an app, especially more senior people will be like, I hey, look, I could rewrite this whole thing in a month and it'll be 10 times better and it'll make a lot more sense. So then you get this this weird issue where like all the developers always think they can rewrite it better than the last guy and they want to rewrite the whole thing, which will add months to the time of completion versus going to a code base that you could probably make little edits to and get it done in, in a reasonable amount of time. But now you're accruing all this kind of technical debt and bad design that may cause issues in the future. Yeah, I uh, I typically recommend not doing a complete rebuild. Uh, I'm more of a refactor in place type of guy, and that you know that could be an extreme amount of refactoring. <laughs> but uh, part of the reason is you just never. Every time I've ever gotten that time, it's just never enough time, and the business still wants features delivered. So you you definitely want to take an in, uh, incremental approach when you're trying to work through it, and it, it's going to be harder and more painful but you're actually probably going to get more of a result and more of a realistic um, outcome. I got a couple of more here. Let's see. Uh, I, this is kind of a good and bad thing, but I'm going to talk about just in general learning in our industry. So learning is something that I think me and Dylan both agree is is really important. We both love teaching and, and learning, and that's really integral to our our jobs, our careers, our businesses, our businesses, our side projects, all that. But there is something to say that if you don't come, if you're trying to join this industry and you don't love the fact that things are changing every six months, that new versions of our software or in our frameworks and our libraries are coming out every six months, that things are changing really quickly, that you need to pretty much, it's pretty much, it's, it's well known in the software industry that you should probably spend time outside of work getting good and getting better and studying. I think when you get to being more senior, um, some senior developers take the path of like, I work nine to five, I come home, that's it. I'm not doing any of the work. And I think sometimes that hurts them while the go-getters out there and kind of really where the industry is being pushed is like, you should really learn this stuff outside of work. And so if you value your personal time, and you value time with your family and and your own hobbies it feels like for a lot of people this is this is not great this is not a good this is not a good career for a lot of people um just in that just because it's the emphasis is is, is on learning and moving fast i know yeah, what you think this is something this is definitely something that i have been getting sort of sick to my stomach about lately and because it's I'm more interested in building projects than I am in actually learning new technologies. And I, I think this is a natural progression as you go from sort of a junior to senior level and, and, and on is that very early on, you just you got to learn everything. And then eventually you start learning that this stuff really isn't all that complicated. Once you once you're you know, once you're at a professional level that you can start, you can pretty much like 
like for instance, I've never worked with GraphQL. I understand the base basic idea of it, and I imagine I could implement it. If you gave me a weekend, I could go pick it up and build something with it. And once you're at that point, maybe it's okay to pull on the back burner a little bit and you know, maybe read a book or do a course or always be tinkering. But um, I I can't put in 20, 30 hours a week into learning anymore and still have a life and still work on projects at the same time. And I think this is one of the um, it's one of the cooler things about the industry because it's it's what I love about it. I love I love that every day I go to work, I'm doing something slightly different and you know, the industry is changing and so dynamic. But it's also one of the reasons I think that leads to a lot of developer burnout if you don't have realistic expectations of what you can do with with all this learning. So do you think it's okay that people could just go home and not learn? I it's it's hard to say. I I would say this. I would say that depending on where you're at in your career that, you know, cuz a lot of senior devs, right? Take us for instance, probably the next path that we're going to go is not necessarily be a senior dev it's to maybe go into management or go into a tech lead role and yeah you're gonna have to learn new things and stay up to date but there's it's more like you have to be aware of new technologies and the benefits that they have you don't necessarily have to know them on a technical level you have to know what what they bring to the table and so the level of effort of understanding sort of a a one-page slick sleet a slick sheet on them is different than being able to actually integrate these into the pipeline or the project um, I would say, generally speaking, I think any good developer is going to tinker and going to play around and going to learn and build things. But I don't necessarily think that you have to be building things in the latest and the greatest technology to be a good developer. I think it's going to make you more marketable in a bad case scenario. And if that's something you're worried about, then yeah, you should definitely be doing that. Um, but generally speaking, as long as someone's learning in some way, a portion of the time and just doesn't drop everything. I think that'd be acceptable once you're later on in your career. Yeah, I agree. I, I, I like the idea too of just in time learning, like instead of, and this maybe applies to juniors and senior devs. It's like, if you really don't need to know this, you don't need to know it for a project or your work. And maybe it's okay every now and then to tinker. You really probably don't need to learn it. Like GraphQL, unless you really like start looking for a job that uses GraphQL, I mean, you probably don't need to go learn it. Like it's fine. If you're you're really used to restful endpoints and, and, and that's, that works for you. Yeah. You don't need to learn it. It's, it's fine. Now, of course, if you're, you know, if you're still stuck in a really old version of PHP and, and you've refused to learn anything and you're sorry to say sort of a dinosaur and you're using really old, old technology, you are going to be a super disadvantage when you try to go look for a job somewhere because you don't know anything new. Um, so that that's a little bit of a different scenario. I still think it's a lot of pressure, though. It's a lot of pressure for people coming in the industry thinking to know know all that. Do, so do you have do you have any more? I have a couple more I can kind of rattle off. Yeah, go, I mean, I could be here for... We, we can make this a five-hour podcast, but I, I got the major ones out of my system. All right, so I'll I'll throw out a couple more, and then we'll wrap this up here. So elitism, I think this happens in every community, but I think there's a couple of different levels of elitism in our industry. There's the elitism that uh, if you're a junior developer or you're trying to get into software development and you don't have a degree, some people could say, well, you know, you have to have a degree. Obviously, that's not true, but there's still maybe some old mindsets out there that you need some sort of piece of paper to become a developer. And so that's kind of elite. But even people who've been in the industry a lot, that can also be an issue. You might be, uh, you know, three or four years into your career and you see may see people, may see people around you that have degrees or, or some other post ed- post-doctorate education and you may feel like you're at a disadvantage because you don't have one. So I think that's sort of a, a level of elitism. There's also the elitism um, and maybe exclusivity of of just the different communities out there. So when you start exploring different communities, do these different open source projects, um, even different companies, you'll find out there's, it's it's really not about like your level of skill most of the time. It's really about relationships. It's about the people you know. It's almost like you're back in high school. There's this popular group of, of people that are doing these things that these are these thought leaders everybody looks to. And then there's everybody else. And if, and me personally, as someone who's trying to 
you know, reach out to more people, build out more relationships, trying to get involved in a lot more communities. I've definitely found some barriers there. You know, I, I remember my first book on Ember.js. I actually reached out to a few of the big people in the Ember.js cookbook or Ember.js community because I was writing the Ember.js cookbook and asked them to write the forward for my book. And I got a lot of ghosting, like, or I had some people that said, oh, send me the book. And then I never heard from them again. And it just kind of feels like, just like anything else, you know, there there is a little bit of elitism. Um, companies, definitely. Like if you're in Google or Facebook or you've worked at one of those companies, people tend to treat you differently. Like you are put on the top of a lot of, I've heard this anecdotally, I don't know for sure, but it sounds like people kind of treat you like you've gone through an elite company that, that everybody looks up to that now all of a sudden you're in the top of everybody's resume piles when you apply for places. I don't know. I think, it, you know, this industry has the same problem as a lot of others. There's, you know, there's, there's a handful of people at the top of these, of these companies and, and these communities and they kind of rule who gets in and who gets out. I don't know. Have you felt like that at all in your journey as a software developer and also a, an influencer? "Quote unquote," an influencer. God. Uh, <laughs> um, I mean, yeah, I I can relate to um, to a sort of uh, not making the cut because not having a degree aspect. That's definitely something that happens at certain organizations. Uh, but as far as elitism, I I think that uh, I don't know. Like, I I don't necessarily agree that like, hey, if you work at a major tech company, should your resume be looked at a little bit higher than others i think it i think it should catch the nod right like i don't think that's that's something that's unreasonable to say well c clearly they have some skill because they were accepted by what we consider to be a very high quality software organization uh and i i i don't know i i found that like networking with some of these guys that are in, in our space they've been pretty receptive but i haven't reached out to everybody um, but whenever I have, it's, it's been nice. Uh, but I think generally speaking that there's going to be a, um, a bit of elitism in any field and it's, it's hard. And I, I don't think it's intentional even like there's people who email me and message me and I, I just don't have the time to get back to them or they, they just want to use me at the end of the day. They just want my time and energy and, and offer nothing in return. I, I don't respond because Sometimes it just doesn't work out. I'm sure I come off as very elitist, but it, I it's just it's just a you know a supply and demand thing, and so I think some of that might be that uh, maybe getting misinterpreted. Yeah, you're you're right. I think I am stretching a little bit. I think definitely at times I, I felt like you know, we can take YouTube for example. I don't want to get too much of a tangent, but there is this whole hierarchy on YouTube where there's channels that get millions and millions of views a month and have hundreds of thousands, if not millions of subscribers that a lot of people think of as like thought leaders in the YouTube community. And, a lot, and some of these are definitely developer channels. And there are people in the development world and these developer channels that are amazing. Like Brad Traversy, he's like amazing guy. He, he definitely, uh, even talks to, to us low lobbies down here that are still trying to, trying to make a, a have fun on YouTube. And then there's other people out there that won't even contact you unless you have the same amount of subscribers or YouTube views as they get every month or every year. So, and maybe it is a part of supply and demand with some of those people. And I understand that, but it's really hard to get on the radar or to network with those type of people. And, if, and sad thing in life is that they, there's this old, I think it's Jim Rohn quote that you're the like average of the five people you hang out with the most. So really, if you want to be um, in these higher echelons of of these communities, you need to probably and probably doesn't hurt to hang out with people that are already at the point of place where you want to be. Now, that's not to say that you cut out grandma and your wife and your family because they're not at the point you want to be. But in general, if you want to try to try to to be at that level, you may want to actually hang out and be friends with those people because you can get tips, they can help mentor you. And there's just some communities where that's possible. And then there's some communities where that's not possible. And some of it is just supply and demand because these people at the top of these communities, just like I can't call, you know, Barack Obama, he's never going to answer my phone call <laughs> if I like 
tweet him or you know find his number he would never answer in fact the secret service would probably be at my house if i did that but there, there it feels like even in the software industry that that there's this level where unless you know someone that knows someone that knows someone you can't even talk to these people or if you you can talk to them it might be just no more than one tweet reply i guess that's that's just the point i'm i'm making i like this also quote you got to get you can either get better or get better so there is ways of definitely getting better and being at the level of those people without trying to 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 grab onto them or ride their coattails or something yeah yeah i mean i like the idea of i'll just get so good that they reach out to me let's do, let's do that instead cool cool uh let me see do i have anything else um i think that's pretty much it um yeah i think i have a few more but maybe we'll leave that for another episode I think we both could could do another episode. We might need to do a positive episode now, like things we like about the industry. To but no one will probably want to listen to that, right? No one wants to hear positivity. I mean, I mean the positivity comes about once every two weeks. I don't know about you, but uh... <laughs> oh, that's another good thing to wrap this up. It's really easy in this industry, especially. I mean, most of us in this industry are highly intelligent, and we're very capable people. So we see problem problems really easily. We see like, why don't we do it this way? Like, why do we have to kind of repeat these mistakes over and over again? And it, it can become frustrating in our industry, just seeing all these little things that we think can be done better um, that, that never get fixed. And so kind of going back to either developer burnout or just you know, kind of even maybe even getting into a depression if it happens so often that it kind of bothers you a lot it's easy to kind of get that like that negative mindset to keep going and and it's okay to be salty every now and then and vent your frustrations and and get that out there but if it kind of continuously happens for a long period of time it, it can definitely mess with you psychologically and it's not uh good for you so keep in mind that maybe if, if you are running into these issues and you're this is overwhelming and all these negativity online. And, and we also are living in a very negative time just with the virus going around and people losing their jobs and all the bad news we see on TV. It's good to, it's, it's, it's good to talk to someone about this stuff. It's good to maybe see a therapist. It's, it's good to try to try not to let it get to you, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Yeah. Mental health is important. We've spent so much time, uh, dealing with our physical health we all want to look good and all that sort of stuff and be healthy and sometimes our mental health gets ignored i know i recently started meditating again about two three times a day on the uh, headspace app uh that's a there's a bunch of free content on there especially uh, extra content right now with everything going on so if you're looking for something to sort of calm some of those nerves i'd highly recommend that sounds good peace everybody bye Hey guys, thanks for watching. If you want to find more about what I'm up to, go to dylanisrael.com. And if you want to know what I'm up to, you can check out my website at eric.video. If you haven't already, please leave us a five-star review on iTunes. It really helps us out. And if you do, you might even be featured on our next episode. Don't forget to check out the website at selftaughtornot.com. From there, you can sign up for a mailing list where we give away free courses and a bunch of cool stuff. And we'll also let you know when the next episode comes out. And finally, if you didn't know, we have a Facebook group. It's called Code Tech and Caffeine. We have over 10,000 members. And you can find the link at selftaughtornot.com. So come join us. We have tons of developers willing to help you guys, mentor you guys. Check it out. Just make sure you go to selftaughtornot.com and check out the Code Tech and Caffeine link. Thanks and take care.